welcome everyone to the Green Mountain Care Board meeting. The first item on the agenda is the Executive Director's Report. Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a couple of announcements first. I um, would like to announce a recent um, rate decision the board made. Uh, today, the board issued a decision on the Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont large group filing. Docket number 131424513. The board reduced the rate from 11.2% to an estimated 9.8%. This order is posted on the Green Mountain Care Board website as well as all other material related to this filing. My second announcement is that next Wednesday the board will not be meeting, so that is June 20th. Um, we will have a regularly scheduled meeting, however, on June 27th. And that's all I have to announce. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda is the minutes of Wednesday, June 6th. I'll second. It's been uh, moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, June 6th without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. And Susan, are you going to tee up uh, the next discussion? I wasn't planning on it, and I may um, ask, uh, oh, no, I won't ask anyone else. I will, I will tee up the discussion as well as I can, but um, so we're, we're honored to have Heidi Klein here today to talk about the results from the recent state health improvement plan assessment. assessment. Sorry, that's assessment okay. Plan. Yeah, um, I actually if this is by way of an announcement too for me. I got a bit of a preview yesterday. Heidi and I were both at the AHEC um, quarterly meeting, and so I'm eager to hear more about the results. But they, I think that we'll find that there are some of them very surprising and informative. So thank you, Heidi. Oh, my pleasure, and thank you for having me. Um, so what I hope to do today is just give you a really quick run through some of the data that are in our state health assessment, um, and mainly to, as a teaser with the hope that you'll go into the state health assessment itself a little more deeply. It is posted on our website. But I wanted to bring it to your attention uh, both to explain the way that we went about engaging a variety of um, community stakeholders, people who are living with various health outcomes, to uh, look at uh, what we know about the health status of Vermonters uh, from a population level, which then will be used to inform our state health improvement plan, which is what we're going to do about it. And to, uh, for those of you on the board or, or concerned, it really is very much tied to the work I want to, that you are responsible for. And I want to make sure that you all see what we've done uh, in service uh, to ourselves, but also in service to you and, and make ourselves, meaning the state health department, available to you um, as you move along in the work that you do. So this is now posted on our website. It's called the Vermont State Health Assessment. You'll see in that little box on the left that there is a focus on health equity, and I'm going to explain more about that in a minute. So let's see if I can do this. There we go. So this is the uh, vision and mission of our state health department. It's The vision is healthy Vermonters living in healthy communities. And our mission is to protect and promote the best health for all Vermonters. So we're really focused on uh, population health outcomes. Um, in order to do that, we are charged every five years uh, with updating what we call our state health assessment and our state health improvement plan. And as I said, the assessment, which I'm going to share with you today, is really answers the question, what do we know about the health of Vermonters? And then the state health improvement plan is, what are we going to do about it? And their improvement plan is based on a process of looking at all the data and then choosing priority areas for action um, across the state. Um, those of you who might be familiar with our current state health improvement plan, I think you are, because the goals that are uh, embodied in the all-payer model, um, which are related to um, chronic disease, substance use, mental health, are in line with the population health goals that were identified for our current state health improvement plan. So just to give you that context. Can you just remind us on the timeline on the state health improvement plan? Yeah, so, so we're in the transition zone right now. So the one that we have currently will run out, as it were, as soon as this new one is published. Uh, so the assessment, you'll see it says uh, 2018. 
Um, and so through the year of 2018 as well, and we're doing the update of the plan, we actually hope to have the new plan published uh, by the end of the fall. Um, and in that, um, there will be uh, the population, the broad outcomes we're looking for, some indicators that we would want to be tracking, as well as recommended strategies. And I'm going to walk you through that at the end so you can see what our plan is moving forward and how we hope to engage the board in helping us figure out certain components of what that plan ought to include so that we can have alignment between the work that you're doing um, and the data and recommendations that we're pulling together. <coughs> our hope is that the assessment and plan be useful to all of our partners in the state and not, because uh, we see it as the state health assessment, not the public health department's mm -hmm. assessment and plan. Okay, so um, just briefly, the ways in which I think, and obviously you will know this better than I, but the ways in which I see the state health assessment uh, being able to inform your work is um, where we are is, is if you look at the, the triple aim, which is uh, improving care, ensuring quality, and impacting population health outcomes. Um, what we are doing is really in that third space, which is about what do we know about population health outcomes and what are the best ways to make improvements. So hopefully the data that we have gathered here and I'm going to share with you can be the basis upon which you would be able to say, thank goodness somebody else has already figured out what we know about the health status of Vermonters. We can build from there. So you don't need to do that work. Um, I know that you all are in charge of setting hospital budgets and you are uh, looking at the community health needs assessments that um, our hospital systems are doing and the data that I am sharing with you and that are in our state health assessment actually are the same data that we have given to our hospital systems. So when they do their community health needs assessments, part of it is looking at quantitative data by their hospital service area and some of it is by doing some community outreach and getting some qualitative data. We at the State Health Department provide them with that quantitative data. It's a series of indicators and measures that we collect and process on a regular basis. And so this data that I'm going to share with you today is data that will be given to all of our hospital systems so that as they continue to move forward with their community health needs assessments, they're looking at uh, the same suite of indicators. I think that helps us as we roll up to the state level in thinking about sort of what do we want at the hospital service area, what are we looking at the state level. We try as best we can to ensure that we're looking at the same data points. Um, and then as I mentioned earlier, um, the, the current priority areas in the current state health improvement plan, so the one that's going to end in 2018, actually were the foundation for the population health outcomes and measures in the all pair model agreement. Um, and so clearly um, there are additional indicators because we didn't look at clinical measures, we were looking at population-wide measures, but it's the same set of goals to say what do we know about the health of Vermonters, where do we see that there are priorities, what should we be doing about it. Um, I think the only other thing I want to let you know in case I skipped it too quickly is that um, in doing this work, I'm going to share with you how we, we actually looked back at the current community health needs assessments of the hospitals in order to inform our state health assessment and set priorities for moving forward this time around as well. Okay. Hi, before you move on, please. I would just add one suggestion to your previous slide. Oh, please. Another area of synergy, which I think is uh, as we work towards a revision health resource allocation plan. I think this data really becomes a core piece of the needs. Absolutely, and in fact, I was going through, um, I met last, a couple of weeks ago with Jessica and Michelle on staff at the Green Mountain Care Board to sort of let them know the types of data that we have available at the health department that might be useful to the health resource allocation plan. Much of, you know, one core piece would be the data that are embodied in this um, health assessment. Thank you. So uh, what process did we use? We started with a series of questions, which are sort of what are the key health challenges in Vermont? But looking beyond that, in public health, we always ask, well, what, not only what are the health issues that we're seeing, but what are the contributing factors? And I'm going to share with you the, the frameworks that we use to think about contributing factors. I know you all have had some conversation about the social determinants of health. It's a, just another way for us to think about contributing factors. It's different language, but same intent. Um, and then we really uh, committed ourselves this time around to looking a little more deeply instead of just looking across um, all the population, really looking a bit more deeply at which populations are affected. 
So when we do our data collection, we are able to break down our data by geographic distribution. So we always run our data by county. We run our, lay, our data by hospital service area and then by the state. So we always have those three geographies. We always run to the extent that we can by age and by uh, sex. We don't necessarily consistently run in other ways. And we challenged ourselves this time to run our data a little bit more, a little differently, because we wanted to say, you know what, there are some other um, populations that have specific characteristics that might be important to us to be looking at that we want to look at. And that's based on our commitment to looking at um, a few things. So I'm going to get to the, that population focus in a minute. The reason I included this one is just this, just this gives you a flavor of how we think in public health and the work that we do. It's a, a basic description of not only do we look at the data, like what does it say, what do we know, but why is this happening and therefore how are we going to deal with it. So each time we ask why, we come up with a different how because ultimately the value of the data is telling us and directing us where we need to go for improvement. But it has to be based on good data and a questioning of what's happening underneath the data in order for us to move forward. So uh, I think you all have seen this framework before. It comes from the University of Wisconsin. It's the population health model uh, that's been touted by the county health ranking system. Um, I brought a copy of the county health rankings report for the state of Vermont. It's been published for over five years. They do it. And what they do is they compare county to county. It's somewhat useful. In terms of the data, we actually have more robust data than they have, but I bring it to you because I think this framework is really useful, and we are trying to use it in what we're preparing for you, because it shows how our health outcomes are based on certain health factors. So those health factors are those four buckets in the middle, health behaviors, access to clinical care, social and economic factors, and the physical environment. So when we say, well, what are, what's contributing to these health outcomes? These are the things that we're asking. If we keep asking, like going one step back, under health behaviors, we see it's tobacco use, diet and exercise, alcohol use, sexual activity. None of this is probably surprising to you. But I just wanted to share this with you because it helps to ground how we decided not only to look at the health outcome data, but we started looking at some of these health factors uh, in the data that I'm going to share with you. And it gets at how do we begin to link what we know about our, our health system functioning, our population health outcomes, and the conditions in which people live. So those social determinants of health, which is a lot of what that last column really is when we start looking at those things. So it breaks it away from big categories into a way of trying to get our heads around what, what, what do we actually measure, okay? These I just thought was very fascinating. Everybody always wants to know, how do we fare compared to another place? So county health rankings enables us to, um, again, they're using all of our data, but they've put it together nicely to show the differences in our communities statewide. So these are the maps that you would found, find in the county health rankings data. And they, they do a rating based on, and ranking based on the health outcomes, those, you know, sort of what we're seeing in terms of morbidity and mortality and what we're seeing in terms of the factors that contribute to those health outcomes. And you'll see they're, by and large, aligned. The shading is very similar. There's a couple of outliers. Again, I'm going to go through this really fast. It's mainly to hopefully tease you to look a little deeper at the data. Um, this is now in our state health assessment. Um, we have a, the first section is about overall health status and statistics, and so this is population-wide. I thought these are some items that might be of interest to the board. You can see our leading causes of death. I don't think any of that's going to be surprising to you, particularly given your focus historically on uh, chronic diseases, cancer and heart disease being the two most important. Uh, those are also driving our health care costs, as you know, as well as and the demands on our health care system. In large part, you'll see to the right are the leading causes of hospitalization versus death, and you'll see injury and poisoning spiking up there. I love the way we had to draw this bar chart with the little break to just show you how off the chart actually the numbers are comparatively uh, for injury and poisoning compared to the respiratory diseases, which are actually the health outcomes that lead to death. I think this is useful, this is useful information for our health systems folks to take a look at. The other, I wanted to, another way that we often look at things are years of potential life lost because we all die of something. 
ultimately, right? Um, but what we really are looking for when we're looking at years of potential life loss is really the potential for, for either for prevention, preventing it, an illness, or at least improving the quality of life for folks. And that's what this uh, years of potential life loss are. And so you'll see cancer, but again, unintentional injury is right at the top of where we're seeing people dying prematurely and where we have opportunities for prevention. Um, so cancer, unintentional injury, disease, uh, heart disease, and then their suicide. So this just gives you a sense how it compares one issue to another, because oftentimes um, it's easy to jump in with some assumption. The other piece I really wanted to point out to you is quality of life. And so you'll see this comes from our, our behavioral risk factor survey. Uh, so this is a survey data. Um, it is a, a sample, but we do feel that it represents uh, Vermonters overall. Um, and we have been able to look at data based on those who report poor physical health and poor mental health. And this is just to give you the beginnings of a preview of how we are able to break down our data. data. The difference, we're able to look at age category, we're looking at educational status, and then we're looking at our Vermonters of color versus our, our white Vermonters. And you can just see some differences. They're, they're not statistically significant in the way that I'm showing you here necessarily, but again, this is just to give you a sense of overall and the kind of data that we're able to share with you. All right, so I talked about the fact that we actually wanted to look at which populations might be most affected. Um, and I don't know how much the questions and issues of health equity have surfaced in the work that you are doing, but it surfaces a lot in our world. Um, and so we, we came to a shared definition about health equity, and, and that is looking at people who have experienced social or an economic disadvantage, historical injustice, and other avoidable inequities that are often associated with the categories of race, gender, ethnicity, social position, sexual orientation, and disability. So we know both through the literature, through the data that's available nationally, and then some of our own local data, that these categories often experience greater health impacts at a disproportionate rate than those who are, in, who are not in one of these social categories. And we wanted to look to see what did we know about what's happening in the, here in the state of Vermont, and would those therefore be areas where we need to target our interventions. So I'm cruising now, because I'm just gonna go whiz bang, right? So race and ethnicity, we decided to look at. So what about our people of color? I think this is one of the more fascinating, this is not a health data slide, but what this tells you is by looking at the data, we, it helps us get past some of our assumptions and why we, we strive to be data driven. And the common assumption, even within our department, is that we have no people of color. And if we do, they all live in Chittenden County, right? It's a Burlington problem or a Winooski, and I'm sorry to say problem is how it is often framed. What I think this is really interesting is this is just straight up census data and it shows you that our, basically our population of color has doubled over since 2015, excuse me, 2000 to 2015 and there has been a growth and spread across the state. So it is no longer just Chittenden County and it is not huge, we still have 7% but it's doubling and the rate of growth is pretty significant for our small state and I think we need to take that into consideration as we look at our population and, and statistics and what it means. I also uh, want to let you know, I think one of the most important things for this because we also looked at our LGBTQ population and every time I've asked the question I've said, so where do you think our LGBTQ fare compared to our people of color in terms of just sheer population numbers and almost Every time people say double, I think we have double the amount, right? They'll say, oh, 15%, you know, people will say, well, it's one in, some people will say, well, it's one in 10, some people will say, no, 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 it's higher than that. It's actually the same. So, but we, we just don't see people of color for some reason, but we see LGBTQ issues all over the place. We don't see uh, these issues. So that was a good pause in learning that we got from doing this research. Um, so for our, for our population of color, we looked at access to care, we looked at quality of life. You can see the uh, categories we're able to collect and report on data. Um, and I think what is, the first one is about has a usual care provider 
I uh, visited a doctor in the last year. You'll see there's not a whole lot of difference. We do very, very well with healthcare access in the state. You know that and you lead that, and we're really proud of that. However, if you look at quality of life, what you'll see is some fairly significant differences uh, by racial makeup. And what I will call out to you is the differences here in uh, self-reported poor physical health and poor mental health amongst our Native American population and our mixed race population. So I'm pointing this out because this is a pattern you're going to see throughout our data, is that those two populations, if we are looking whether it be on reported poor health outcomes or uh, what we call risk behaviors, behaviors that would put you at risk of poor health, these two, these two groups stand out at, as uh, being in a different place than our other populations. Uh, if you look at, again, so here's depression among adults. Again, this is what you're seeing. The highest numbers are rated by our Native American and our multiracial population. The protective factors, those things that are good, the people that our youth are seeing in their lives, and, and this includes talking with uh, parents about school at least weekly, spending 10 or more hours um, in the school activities, having teachers that care about you. These are the things that um, you've probably heard when you have heard presentations about ACEs, right? And those early childhood events and how that sets one up for either positive or negative health experiences. What we are seeing here is our populations of color have, are reporting fewer uh, protective factors than our white non-Hispanic. Um, that's important for us to be looking at what's going on there that they have fewer protective factors and what is that therefore going to mean in terms of their health outcomes and their health needs over time. The LGBTQ identity, that was another area that we were looking at. Um, access to care, as you'll see, um, we're looking at LGBT in the dark, darker blue and uh, heterosexual in the lighter, not a whole lot of difference in terms of folks reporting access to regular care. But if you look at quality of life, which are those pie charts, there's a pretty big difference between what our LGBT uh, folks are reporting and uh, what the heterosexual community. Those who, and this is percent of adults who report fair or poor health. So these are, these are not what we would like to see. Gender orientation. This is just to give you a sense of who, do, who, who are our LGBT. Um, what is interesting to see here is just we do have, if you look at the overall numbers, remember I said we only have about 7% of LGBTQ in, in Vermont. That's the total, but if you break it down by category, you'll see that the highest percentage is in our 18 to 24 year olds. So we expect that as time goes by, we actually have, might have a, a higher number of folks reporting. LGBT status overall because it is now something that people feel comfortable reporting where they perhaps didn't before. Uh, we're looking at sexual health risk behaviors in that right side and I think what is important to see is the difference between our LGBT and our heterosexual populations uh, on those who have had sex before age 13 or have had any high risk HIV transmission behaviors. So we see a significant difference. Uh, that's concerning to us in terms of potential health outcomes. Depression. Um, so we're looking here, the difference uh, reported sad among high school students is on the left. The, the adults diagnosed with the depression, you can see the differences here between our LGBT um, population, our heterosexual. Those are significant differences in terms of mental health and depression. This one is, this is one of those, the next one on the right hand side is one of the things that I don't understand and just, I just don't personally, thankfully, have any uh, personal experience with intimate partner and sexual violence and I looked at this data and I thought, oh my gosh, what is going on here? If you look at the LGBT versus the heterosexual, look at the difference. So adolescents hurt by someone they were dating in the last year, that's that first Bars, look at 24% of our LGBT versus heterosexual, which is 8%. 8% is still high. Let's just be clear, like we shouldn't be seeing this, but 24%. Adolescents ever forced to have sex, 24% in our LGBTQ. And adults who ever experienced intimate partner violence, 32% among our LGBT. That's, so these numbers are appalling. If you further broke that down by gender, what would be? Uh, that's a really good question. You know, I don't know, but I can find out. Yeah, and, I, and I'm quite sure we can run that statistic, so I'd be glad to ask someone to do that, Jess. 
So tobacco, tobacco, alcohol, and drug use. Again, we want to see it were risk behaviors different among the people um, who, who identify as heterosexual versus those who are LGBT. And you'll see in adolescents and in adults, there are differential reports of smoking, binge drinking, and marijuana use. So those risky behaviors are showing more in our LGBT group. The protective factors for youth, again, on the left are LGB students, on the right are heterosexual students, and there are those who are LGB report fewer protective factors. We know that that's a setup for a lifelong um, challenge. People with living with disabilities, I'm sure you've seen some of this data before. Um, I know that uh, we have a very active and engaged uh, folks, which is fabulous, and they've been working with us as well. Initially, we just have some you know, basic statistics about what percent of, of folks in Vermont are living with some kind of either intellectual or physical, um, excuse me, cognitive or physical disability. So you can see just this straight up numbers. Um, and you'll see that our, our people of color and people who are LGBT as adults have higher numbers of uh, self-reported disability. I don't know why, it's a good question. Again, so asking the why will help us figure out the how. The type of disabilities, this is probably familiar to you, but we will have this data available. Uh, so you can see the difference between the cognitive, hearing, visual, mobility, independent living, and self-care. The highest rates right now are um, in mobility and cognitive, but we will, what I would point out here is it's showing them as discrete when often it's multiple. Right? They're not usually discrete disabilities. Uh, we were looking at, again, we tried to do the same questioning for each of our subpopulations, so we looked at access to care and quality of life. Not a huge difference on access to care other than dental care here. Uh, and you'll see throughout that access to dental care has, is an enormous challenge, and, uh, and it, in fact, it comes out as one of our priorities for moving forward is um, oral health. Uh, quality of life, we are seeing a significant difference in uh, self-reporting between our uh, members of our community who have a disability uh, versus those who have no disability. That's what reporting fair to good health, fair, excuse me, fair to poor health, or being diagnosed with depression. These numbers are very, again, really frightening. Risk behaviors, um, this again is looking, we're trying to say, you know, looking consistently about what we know contributes to health or, or doesn't. Uh, smoking, physical activity, and nutrition is looking the difference between those who have a disability and, and those who report ha not having one. I'm not sure that any of these are statistically significant other than the smoking, uh, but that's still alarming. As we know, it's one of the three behaviors that contributes to the four chronic diseases that account for 50% of our deaths in Vermont. So that's significant. Um, and then if you look at those are the four chronic diseases, lung disease, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. So our people who are living with a disability have higher rates across the board for chronic disease. We looked at social class and social economic status. These are, this is just sheer uh, demographics on this one, so I'm going to jump over it, but it, it's just helpful to ground what we know and how we've defined using the federal poverty levels to, to talk about economic status and people who are living in poverty. Uh, and then we decided to look at uh, quality of life, right? We've done this for each of them. Is, is, is there a difference? We didn't do access to care for this one. I don't know why. I apologize. But jumping to quality of life, looking at the difference between those who report fair or poor health, uh, physical or mental health, and then reporting depression. And I'm going to pause here for a second because this is basically what we see in every single slide, the, these curves, right? So the... Those who have at fewer, who have access to more financial resources generally report better physical and mental health and better, generally report better health outcomes, right? So it's about how people feel about their health as well as the diseases that we have looked at and the health outcomes we've looked at. 
And by and large, we will see the same thing uh, based on education, right? So the more education you have, the healthier you are, the happier you are, with some notable exceptions, which I will take you through. Um, what we also found, and it doesn't really show here, is this question of the interplay between um, income and education. And from what I understand from our statisticians, uh, education is more important than income in terms of adopting healthy behaviors. So even if you have a lower income but you've had a higher level of, of education, you're more likely to adopt healthier behaviors. Um, and the thing that is not here on, on our racial makeup that I want to go back to is, if I can, there we go. Um, in poverty, we don't have this slide, but reported nationally, and that what we're looking at too is if it plays out here, and that is that our people of color, even with the higher income, still report poorer health outcomes than our poorer white members of the Vermont Society. So I hope, did I, was that clear the way I stated that? Okay. Uh, so access to care, this is not gonna be surprising to you, you all know this. Uh, the difference based on uh, financial means and um, educational attainment. Not huge differences here, other again pointing out that we are not doing a good job with access to dental care. Uh, the cost associated with healthcare, we wanted to see if that, if that had anything to do with why people were getting care or not getting care, and if it mattered, uh, if high school, excuse me, if your educational attainment mattered, as you'll see, there's not a huge difference here, uh, because we do so well in ensuring people and making, sh making sure people have access. Protective factors, again, this is the same thing, is that if your mother has a high school um, education or, or less, you are less apt <coughs> to have those protective health factors in your life than if your mother has some college degree or more. Student connectedness, this is something that we look at again. Again, it's part of this whole framework of protective factors in childhood. I think this one's really important to look at um, because this actually does show some really interesting things. Again, this is these are students, so let's just remember that in grades nine through 12 who are reporting uh, how they feel connected or not. This is not a time of life that most people feel connected. Like, let's just take that as the bar. Um, so I'm not surprised that we see somewhat low percentages here, but I, I think the differentials are what's important. So we see that, um, that in terms of connectedness, our heterosexual youth feel, 53% feel connected, whereas our LGB folks, only 31% feel connected. Connectedness is really important in terms of um, mental health status, quality of life, and the um, adoption of risky or non-adoption of risky behavior. Connectedness is hugely important. Smoke, and now I'm gonna switch over here. This is one of these really interesting ones, I think, if you look over here, uh, is smoking during pregnancy. Um, we look at this a lot. This is one of those data points, uh, which I forgot to mention the criteria for why some things are in this report and other things are not. We asked our data analysts to look by our populations of concern, but we also said, point out places where you know we're not doing as well as our counterparts in other states, or where we're going in the wrong direction. Smoking and pregnancy is one of those data points. We do very poorly on smoking and pregnancy among certain populations and it's a really hard nut to crack. Does that manifest itself on in um, disproportionately high and low birth weight babies relative to the rest of the country? We actually do really well in Vermont in terms of low birth weight, um, and, our, and, our, and our birth rates are so small, are so small statistically, we have a hard time parsing that out, but I do know we pulled together specialized data, uh, which I can send to you after this, around low birth weight because uh, somebody else had that same question. So rather than trying to answer it, I'll send you the actual data if that's okay. Sure. Uh, and then this is just some of my fun data. <laughs> my fun data as in things that surprised me. Uh, first of all, it is outstanding to me and scary that 48% oh, that of pregnancies in Vermont are unintended. 48% of our pregnancies are unintended. That's huge. We should be looking at this. I didn't know that. Um, and then, it, and it, you know, not surprising, I would say, 86% so the highest rate is among um, our under 20 age, 
and among those who are, are lesser indicated, but we still have 49% of our some college educated uh, women who are having unintended pregnancies. We just think that's something we should be looking at. Really interesting. Youth eating habits, this is one where I thought this was important, so this one, cracked, this one actually flies in the face of our assumptions. If you look at which populations in high school are actually doing better than others in terms of their fruit and vegetable consumption, which is our behaviors that we really want to see, um, it is actually our black, our Hispanic, almost all of our populations are doing better than our white non-Hispanic in actually eating uh, as we promote. Uh, and, and it switches um, when you get to adults. Uh, and so the adults, uh, it's just fascinating, fascinating data. And again, the reason to share this is always to say, so what is it telling us and why are we seeing this data? Therefore, what are we gonna do about it? This is one of my other favorite ones because it flies in the face of what we would assume. High risk drinking behavior among older adults. As you are wealthier, you drink more. As you have more college or more education, you drink more. This is not the story we tell ourselves, right? So this is really important data. Again, let's not make assumptions and let's say why is that, right? We could speculate, but we probably need to dig a little deeper. Uh, so I'm gonna switch now from the data that I'm planning to share with you. I did at the very end of my slide deck give you um, the link online to the full data set um, and because I only like, gave you a teeny, teeny smattering. What I didn't give you at all frankly, was the data by disease, right? So I gave you the populations in focus section. We also have sections on chronic disease, substance use, early childhood, um, environmental health, <coughs> infectious disease, all of those uh, that you can go into and see. But I really wanted to give you this sort of populations in focus so that you could see how we've been trying to work the data a little bit differently. And again, get closer to what is it that we actually know about the health status of Vermonters what are, and which populations are most affected by things. So that's the data that I shared with you today. Um, where we're going with this is we then sort of said, okay, of all the data that we've looked at, what do we know to be the priorities, right? So in order to get a state health improvement plan, which has three to five goals, you have to look at all the data and then winnow it down. So our state health improvement plan will have outcomes, indicators, and strategies. Um, did I tell you here? I think I did. These are the five priorities that came out of the state health assessment. Uh, and the, just so that you know, the way that we governed and made these decisions, we had a, a steering committee that included the secretary of the agency of human services, our health commissioner, um, the director of One Care of Vermont, uh, the director of Building Bright Futures, and then um, a health equity um, leader, Mer um, Mercedes Avila, who served as our steering committee. And then we engaged 180 stakeholder groups uh, to help us look at the figure out what data to look at, actually read the data, and then identify their priorities. And through three different priority setting sessions with those advisors, we came up with these five areas of focus for the next state health improvement plan. Three of them are very familiar to you because they're already part of the existing state health improvement plan. So those will carry forward, uh, maybe with some more granularity in terms of which populations we want to focus on. So for the state health improvement plan, uh, chronic disease, you heard me call out, for example, um, our populations living with disabilities. Right? So we might have a focused area on that. Substance use disorder, we might be looking, uh, and mental health, we might choose to be looking at our LGBTQ population in addition to the population at large. Um, oral health was the number one issue identified by our community partners in need, and that's because that is where we lack access to services and because oral health is affected by and then reinforces cycles of chronic disease and cycles of poverty. So that was one. And then early childhood development because we all know that if we really wanna move upstream into prevention, this is where we need to focus some of our efforts. And so there was a real desire to make it a part of our state health improvement plan 
overall and figure out how we make those connections with the good work that's already happening, but have it be connected, uh, make the connection between early childhood exposures, investments, behaviors, and long-term health consequences. So these are the priority outcomes that we'll be looking at. We're gonna use, so, we're, so for each of those, so we may have like an overall uh, area of focus, those five areas. For each of those, we will be identifying a series of measures, like where or an indicator sort of targets of where we want to be, and then we'll be coming up with strategies to try and change, make change. And I'm sharing with you this framework that we're going to be using because I think it will be helpful to you. Some of you may have seen this, it's, it's the, some people call it the John Auerbach model, but when we move to it, we recognize that, remember if we go back to the idea of what contributes to health and where do we need to sort of focus our efforts, it's clear there are three places that we can focus our efforts in that intersection of healthcare and public health. So one is looking in our healthcare system. So that first bucket, as we call it, is what are the changes that are needed in our healthcare system or in the clinical setting to improve health? <laughs> The second bucket is where is that integration, and, and I know you all have been thinking a lot about this, between clinical care and community services writ large, and so a lot of the integration work that you've been doing and uh, care management has been related to how do we connect physical health services with mental health services, with substance use services, with some of the social ser services that people need in order to be healthy, such as housing, transportation, um, access to food, et cetera. That's that second bucket of sort of making sure the individual has the full range of, of uh, care and services. And then the third is really what do we need to do population-wide for prevention, which is usually the sweet spot for public health, right? And that gets us also into the work that we do with our non-health-related partners in transportation, housing, et cetera. So we will be looking with um, support from multiple stakeholders and, and in dialogue with you in particular for what are the measures we should be looking at in the clinical uh, health system and in that integrated system between healthcare and other social services, and then what are some of the strategies we should be looking at. And we'll be looking at those across the five areas. If I, I'll go back for you, if I can. Across these five areas, what are the strategies in each of those three buckets for these five areas of outcome? So that's where we're going moving forward. That's the work that's going to be happening over the summer. Uh, I leave you with two things. One is this is the vision that will be uh, um, informing the state health improvement plan. And I share it with you for two reasons. Um, this came from those 180 stakeholders. This is not our vision at the health department. Uh, we asked them, what in five years, if we've uh, worked successfully to achieve health equity, meaning health and equity, what would it look like? The vision is all people in Vermont have a fair and just opportunity to be healthy and live in healthy communities. And then these are the values that they set forth. I want to share with you the right-hand side. Those are the conditions that are necessary in a community. So for, for those of you who've been thinking a lot about how do we connect our health care system with the social determinants of health, it's about connecting with those sectors. And uh, we at the health department are doing that through the Health and All Policies Task Force of the governor. Um, and so they're going to be using the same rubric and the same way to look at what are the contributions that other sectors can make towards creating the conditions in which health can thrive. Um, and that will be in that third bucket of strategies. We'll be looking with them too. So I think that's all I'm gonna tell you. I think I probably went over time and I apologize. Uh, the last slide has lots of links for you. Uh, so the full report that looks like this. Uh, but if you want to go to data that's beyond this report, I've shared with you a few places where you can find them. So there's the scorecard for our existing plan, which will show you how we track you know, we set goals and indicators and how we track whether we're getting there. So it's the accountability system that's built in to our state health improvement plan, which will be the accountability system that will continue just with new goals and indicators. I also wanted to share with you the community health needs assessments by health service area, hospital service area, because I think that's important data for you to know that we have and that we pull from and we used in identifying the data for our state health needs assessment and informing 
what the priorities were. So we looked at the priorities set by each of the community health needs assessments and ruled those up in as a, a core criteria in setting priorities. And then our um, data encyclopedia is actually a PDF that gives you um, a, a link to all the data sources that the Vermont Department of Health um, has responsibility for, um, what's in those data sources, how we can run them, and it gives you a point person. So those of you who love data, mm -hmm. that's a good place for you to go. I am done. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? Um, I just had a question on, it's very interesting data, um, as far as the sample size and the self-reporting, because in, in certain areas I would imagine the sample size is really small, yeah. you start cutting it down, and um, you know, so how reliable is that data, probably particularly when you get into ethnic groups and ages and things like it's, that? Yeah, no, it's a fabulous question, and it's, honestly it's one that we've been really cautious about running our data in the past because we felt like we wouldn't have adequate for comparative purposes, right? So there's the what can we report without, uh, frankly, making it so easy to identify because of our small populations, right? Versus what can we report reliably? All of our survey data, we're very confident um, that our samples are representative of the state because the, the main surveys that we do are the behavioral risk factor survey, the house, um, the, um, and these are the self-reported sampled data, are the behavioral risk factor survey and the youth risk behavior survey, which we have been running for 20 plus years. And uh, it, the sampling strategy has been vetted and approved by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We're, pretty, we're really pretty confident, confident on our, those samples versus the census data where we can say we feel like we have data across all Vermonters. And some of that is pulled from more of what we would call our census data sources. Uh, and where we don't have enough data, we will say not enough data to report. Um, and it's also why you'll see that a lot of the data that we did not charge ourselves with saying whether something was statistically significant. That's where that would matter. And we haven't done that. So we are reporting sheer percentages without saying whether it's statistically significant because that's when do we have all the right people are we, do we feel that we're comfortable, that it's reliable, that we can do that? Great, thanks. Any other questions or comments from the board? I just, actually, just a quick one. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you. This is tremendously helpful, and you've been helpful as we starting, are starting this process of reimagining the HRAP, and I think, as Robin was saying earlier, you and I have talked about, this is going to be so foundational for that work. Um, we can hopefully build on it and collaborate so that mm -hmm. we're you know, working on all this together. One of the um, pieces that actually just struck me as I was looking at this now was if you look on um, your eight, page eight slide mm -hmm. with that framework for thinking about policies, health factors, health outcomes, and with clinical care, you know, it's access to care and quality of care. Sorry. No, that's okay. I'm going to keep going so that everybody can see it. Here we go. Yeah, just that, you know, the clinical care, the two components to thinking about clinical care are access to care and quality of care. Um, and I always struggle with how do you measure, you know, how, how are we measuring quality of care? Yeah. You know, people write dissertations and books and, and come up with measures and all that. And as I was thinking about your framework for strategies here, you have this bucket of tra traditional clinical prevention, which is obviously going to be a, an important component of the framework. And then I guess then I went and was looking at the vision and the core values. And the core values are around equity, affordability, and access. And the um, and the services, making sure that the services are available, accessible, affordable, coordinated, culturally and linguistically appropriate. And it just struck me that quality, quality is not in there. And so I was just wondering, how does that, how does yeah. measuring quality and thinking about quality of clinical care benefit? Yeah, quality? I think it's a really important thing to, to point out. I would say that, you know, sort of in the world in which we live in public health, which is less service and, and care oriented than, you know, sort of these other things. Quality is, of care is not something and uh, that we think about, and so I think the fact that it's not in the vision statement is an oversight. It was a fact that it didn't surface in the conversations that we were having. Um, other than uh, when we did some focus groups. So we did, we went out and we did focus groups with um, populations, our, our focus population, so people with disabilities, LGBTQ, people, um, 
who are um, living in poverty and then are, are ethnic and racial, they talked about quality of care, but they didn't talk about it in the way that we do. Their quality of care was about being understood and being respected. So it was more like that patient experience quality of care as opposed to a differential measure of like whether or not a provider is following the best practice um, with clinical procedures. So it really didn't factor into what people were talking about, which is why it didn't come out. Um, I don't have a better answer for you, but it, it is interesting. It is interesting. And I just also want to come back to this here because one thing for those of you who are geeks like I am about getting your percentages right, the thing that really makes me crazy about this one is it actually shows that clinical care is worth 20% of the contributors to health outcomes, but actually if you look at it, it in, in most of the literature it's 10%. And the reason it shows up at 20% here is that genetics is not listed. Right, so if you take out the percent that is genetically connecting to your health outcomes, because the idea was, well, you can't change genetics, but you can change these other things, healthcare then gets um, a higher per percentage rank. But we actually know that in terms of actual health outcomes, those things that contribute to or prohibit positive health outcomes, access to and quality of care is actually only 10% which is always shocking because, that's, that's where all money goes. yeah, well, and let me say, we initially didn't think we would talk much about um, access to care in, and, and care at all, um, and our previous state health assessment and improvement plan didn't include access to care or quality of care uh, because we were always talking about prevention and upstream. That's where we live and, and focus in public health, but we realized that if this is going to be a plan and for the state and not for the health department, what we heard from the folks we talked to is access to care is essential. Um, and what we heard, particularly from the, fo the populations in focus, that until we deal with issues related to access to care prevention is, is not a priority. And so in order to be respectful of what we heard with everyone we engaged, we realized, oh yeah, it has to. And in order for it to align across all of our state planning efforts, it has to, because we really want to make sure that our state, you know, that what we produce as the state health plan works and aligns with the work that you're doing. Uh, and the work that's being done on the health system reform at AHS and works with our other partners. So that's how we ended up with the three bucket approach. Any other questions or comments? If not, this time we'll open it up to the public. I'll yes. start us off, Dale. Um, how are we? Well, one, the pregnancy, and this is more of an edit. What slide are you on, Dale? Um, I'm commenting on the slides in general, but okay. Okay. commenting about the slide that shows the pregnancy. Yeah. 48%. Mm-hmm. Um, we had three children. If I was filling out that form, all three would be unintended. <laughs> because what caused the first one could probably, <laughs> I mean, so I'm a, you know, like, hey, we're 100 percent. We're not 48 percent. Um, so I'm not quite sure what to think of that in terms yeah. of yeah. how you measure that. Mm -hmm. That's just mm -hmm. a net edit. Um, the other one is, oh, culture in terms of the Native American population. Uh, I'll never forget, my dad showed up to watch a track meet and all the Native Americans of that ABC program, they were all trying to figure out whose dad he was in the program. He was mine. Um, and seriously, it, it, was, it was the funniest thing you ever saw. They were all looking at everybody else because he's not white yeah. and he's my dad. And the, you should have seen the shocked faces when they found out he was my dad. Mm -hmm. Like, wow, yeah, wait. He lives in Vermont. Yeah, we're in Vermont. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you're going to know where I'm going. When it came to measurements, because my mom was Irish, they didn't allow you to record Native right. American back then. And you still have that problem today because of the assimilation, even though you can see it when you go into the culture. So. 
is it that small a population? Because you can measure it on the reservation, but it goes way beyond the reservation. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, you know, what I take from all the data um, really is sort of, what is it telling us? Is it telling us the whole story, right? And what do we need to know that's driving that? So for our native populations, I think we have enough here to say that there are differences in their health experiences, right, than, than our other populations. So regardless of the size and whether it's full, that we fully account for everyone, there's still reason to be looking at that. Um, and that indeed, we may find that it, there is a larger population than our self-reported in the data that we have because we're reliant on the census data for that. Okay. Uh, but there's enough here to give us pause. Thank you that that is true. I really love to hear that and see that happening. The part B is when you get to the social determinants of health within this population, and I've heard this my whole life and saw it as mm -hmm. I talked with my friends, the culture disassociation had a profound effect on the social determinants Absolutely. of health, which cr creates a different metric for how do you measure right. that impact. I think it, one of the things that we charge ourselves using the health equity lens that I didn't really speak very much about is where do we know that historical discrimination and injustice, which is true for our native populations, right? How that actually leads to differential access to the social determinants. So if you are Native American, you have a differential access to housing, transportation. You are more likely, you know, those things that are, um, that are the conditions of healthy living by virtue of the fact that you're Native American, right? So we know that if we look at, from equity, we look at race, gender, and poverty. Those three things below, so if, social, so if our health outcomes are here and our social determinants are there, what's not on, this chart in this framework is the fact that access to all of those things in those sort of that middle box are determined and influenced greatly by uh, those three primary issues of race, gender, and class, we, which we don't like to talk about either, but that's, you know, we use the word poverty, but it's really systemic class issues. Those three set you up for either living in communities that have the infrastructure, the resources for healthy conditions or not. And we really need to look at, at that po at a policy level and not think of it as a problem of the individual. That's a structural problem. Okay. Any other questions or comments? All right, well, thank you so much. I love sharing this data, as you probably can tell. I'm happy to follow up in whatever way, and I do hope that you find it useful in your deliberations. And um, as uh, Susan knows and her staff know, we are more than happy uh, to collaborate whenever we can to make sure that you have the data, as well as what we know about what works for health. There's a lot of, I know, conversations where our healthcare system is now being held accountable for things that happen outside traditional medical practice, right? Uh, and so a lot of the, like, what works for prevention, what works outside the clinical setting is where we live in public health. And so we're happy to be partners with you when it comes to strategies as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you want me to do anything about that? I think we're good. Okay, well, then come up. You're leaving Sarah behind? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Uh, yeah, I will. Um, actually, our several teams will. Um, so, so we're going to be speaking with you about generally uh, regulation of accountable care organizations and the walk through the major regulatory activities that uh, are going to take us all through to 2019. Um, before I get to the agenda for this presentation, I just wanted to remind you that um, 18 VSA 9382 and Rule 5 <clears throat> distinguish between two processes. Uh, first is ACO budget review, which is obviously uh, annually with ongoing monitoring. And uh, the second is ACO certification, which is done once with annual verification by the board. So here's the agenda. Um, to give you some context for the ACO budget guidance uh, that we're gonna walk through, we'll start by reviewing um, criteria for the board's review of ACO budgets. And these include statutory criteria, as well as the requirements of the all-payer ACO model agreement. Um, next, we will discuss uh, the regulatory processes we know are in store for us between now and 2019, um, namely reviewing ACO's 2019 budgets and payer programs and verifying OneCare's continued eligibility for certification. Next, we are going to walk through the ACO budget guidance and reporting requirements for 2019 that we have drafted, uh, including a proposed timeline for public comment and your vote on that guidance. Sorry, this is a busy slide. So, <laughs> uh, rule five, the administrative rule that um, took effect last year, says that um, in deciding whether to approve or modify an ACO's proposed budget, the board will consider uh, the statutory criteria in 18 VSA 9382, as well as any applicable requirements of the all-payer ACO model agreement. There are 15 statutory criteria, um, really considerations, uh, in the that are listed in the statute. I didn't include them all here, um, but I did include some examples, and they, they are uh, information on utilization, uh, the extent to which an ACO provides incentives for investments to strengthen primary care, the extent to which an ACO provides investments for integration of community-based providers in its care model, or investments to expand capacity in existing community-based providers, the extent to which the ACO provides investments for incentives for investments in social determinants of health and information on an ACO's administrative costs. Um, as you all know, the all-payer ACO model agreement includes a number of requirements that are applied to the state, but that obviously guide the board's regulation of ACOs. And these requirements include a Medicare total cost of care per beneficiary growth target and an all-payer total cost of care per beneficiary growth target, which is um, a compound annual growth rate of 3.5% or less over the five performance years of the agreement. Um, the agreement also includes um, minimum standards for what types of payer programs count as scale target initiatives. It includes um, targets for the number of Medicare and all-payer beneficiaries aligned to these scale target initiatives. Um, it requires reasonable alignment amongst payer programs in key areas such as attribution methodology, um, quality measures, and payment mechanisms. And finally, uh, the agreement includes um, several population health goals and a number of um, 
quality targets underneath those population health goals. <clears throat> so before we start walking through the 2019 budget guidance, um, we wanted to briefly discuss some process considerations. Um, so it is possible that an ACO other than one care could submit a 2019 budget for your approval. If the ACO planned to participate in a program with um, Medicaid or with a commercial insurer, they would also need to be certified by the board. Um, a Medicare only ACO would not need to be certified. Uh, so we have not heard of another ACO um, possibly submitting a budget, but since it is a possibility, we chose to develop two versions of the ACO budget guidance. Um, one that is specific to one care and another that is generic. Um, both versions were based on the ACO budget guidance that you approved last year. Um, however, the obviously one care specific one is tailored to one cares model, which we uh, learned a great deal about last year. And we felt that this approach would allow us to be more efficient um, and get the most useful information uh, we could from one care in the initial submission. So today we'll be walking through the one, one care specific guidance. Um, we will have the generic version of the guidance up on the website if it's not already for folks to comment on. Um, in review. Um, I think there's a missing slide, but um, so the other process that we're going to definitely have to undertake in 2019 is to verify one care's continued eligibility for certification. Um, so rule five says that once an ACO is certified, uh, it has to annually verify that it continues to be eligible for certification and it has to notify the board of any material changes to its policies, procedures, um, programs, organizational structures, health information infrastructure, or any of the other matters that are uh, addressed by the certification statute or administrative rule. Um, so we have drafted, uh, and you should have it in your packets, a form for one care to complete and submit to us. Um, uh, because ACOs could be very different from one another, we would anticipate creating uh, an ACO-specific form like this for each ACO that the board certifies uh, that would be tailored to the documents we have received during the initial certification process. Um, so the form that we developed for one care uh, asks about, like I mentioned, changes to the key policies uh, and other documents that we reviewed earlier this year. It also asks for updates on issues that were raised during uh, the certification process. So for example, one care mentioned that it is um, planning on adding uh, condition-specific content to Care Navigator for patients to access, and we want uh, an update on, on how that's going and progressing, things like that. Uh, finally, and very importantly, we are asking for an explanation of how One Care complies or plans to comply with the new statutory certification requirements that Susan covered um, the other week in the legislative wrap-up. Uh, and so now we're to this slide. Um, this slide and the next uh, restate those um, statutory amendments. Um, the underlined language is the new language, obviously. Um, I won't read them, but uh, essentially this change uh, relates to um, parity for mental health care. Uh, the first bullet here relates to uh, what's referred to as pay parity, um, and the last bullet, second bullet there, uh, relates to um, uh, preventing and addressing the impacts of childhood adversity and the ACO's efforts and connections in that regard. <clears throat> 
So our, our plan is to run this um, certification verification process uh, concurrently with the budget review process. So we would uh, require One Care to complete the form um, on or before October 1st, 2018, which is the same date that we would be requesting their um, budget submission in uh, the, the guidance that Melissa's gonna walk through. Um, pursuant to Rule 5, we would then have 30 days to um, notify One Care if we need additional information. Uh, One Care certification would remain valid while we, uh, while the review process is pending. Um, if there are any problems that are identified during the review, uh, they could be addressed through a corrective action plan or other remedial process such as a monitoring plan, um, whatever the board feels is appropriate. The, the final bullet there, um, considerations for Rule 5 update, is just to be clear that we are, we do expect One Care's policies to change in early 2019 to uh, reflect its updated or new payer programs and, and the requirements of those programs. Um, and, you know, if we want to know about those changes prior to October of 2019, it may make sense to, um, I guess, enhance the, the section of Rule 5 that uh, requires an ACO to automatically notify the board of, of certain changes. I think I've talked with you about that section before, um, but that's something we are talking through, uh, we are still talking through potential amendments to Rule 5, um, and that's one of the areas we're looking at, I guess. Okay, and so Melissa's gonna walk through the One Care specific, well, several of us. Hi everyone, um, up in front of us is the table of contents for the 2019 budget guidance and reporting requirements for One Care Vermont. And it was a collaborative effort between our policy team and our finance team and our analytics team. So um, we have everyone here to speak to their respective sections. Um, so we began the development of this guidance by reviewing One Care's submission from last year, which we built through a process with key stakeholders and, and our actuary, and also reflected on the Green Mountain Care Board's hospital guidance for this year. Um, anything that was in the certification section that we approved in this past year has been moved to that uh, verification form that Mike spoke about. And so this year we have streamlined the guidance as much as possible to focus on the ACO's model of care and their relationships with providers, payers, and the community and also to provide guidance on the all-payer model requirements. And as you'll see at the very bottom of this, we have a test year for the primary care spend measure by payer and non-claims and non-claims specification, which Michelle will walk through. So the timeline for the um, submission for this year is we have up, um, starting with our presentation to you today, then public comment from now until June 30th, which is up on our website. Um, we plan to come back in front of you to discuss any public comment that we received and any possible changes on July 11th. If there are no changes proposed, then we would um, discuss the potential to vote on the guidance on that date. And we also have July 18th where we would come back if a July 11th is, is not a date where we would vote. The timeline below it is subject to change at the moment because we're still finalizing some of the dates um, in November and December, but we will uh, plan to release this by August 1st and have uh, the ACO submit their budget and annual reporting to us by October 1st. The tentative dates for presentations are the ACO to present on October 17th and then the board to present our analysis of their presentation and our review of the guidance on November 7th. We would open it up for public comment and then um, come back to, with a potential vote on November 28th to establish the ACO's budget. And then the um, ACO would receive their written order from us in December. But 
we'll update you on that timeline if it does change. So the first section of the reporting requirements asked the ACO to provide a, an executive summary to us. Um, you know, we'd like to see what their differences and changes are between 2018 and 2019. So this may include providers who are joining or exiting the network, uh, highlights of their programs with their successes or challenges, any changes in staffing or operational budget. And um, we realized last year that there were needed to be assumptions made where during their budget submission because some of their contracts are not finalized yet. So any assumptions that were made on the attributed lives and their per member per month payments that they'll be receiving from the payers. So this section is regarding the ACO's provider network. And we have several appendices that are also on our website for review. We did not include them in the printouts today. But um, we have one, um, one, our first appendice is providers by type. And really, we're getting a snapshot of the contracted entities and independent providers that will be participating by health service area the types of payer contracts that they will be participating in, whether those providers are new for 2019, so we thought we can do that comparison to uh, determine who are additional to the network, and also several population health questions that we're interested in specific to one care, uh, whether they have medication-assisted treatment providers in their network, and whether they're using Care Navigator. Um, we also have a summary provider template that looks at specialists by health service area and types of primary care providers by health service area. So we have a new question this year which asks about scale um, and recruitment strategies over the next five years to, um, for One Care to report on what their initiatives may be in the coming years. And then finally, we have a number of questions about provider contracting and their risk models. And we've asked to see the provider participation and collaboration agreements and you know the levels of risk that are required between the ACO and provider in their health service area. This will help us to, um, for our actuary when we're evaluating the risk mitigation section and risk model of care. So then the next section turns to the ACO's participation with the payers and what those program arrangements are. So we, um, we will expect to receive information from One Care on their 2019 development of any contractual agreements that they have with payers. And we are also asking for their payer quality measures and analysis of that from the previous year. And then within the contracts, we will ask for the risk model in by payer with the amount of risk and upside or downside gain that they're assuming and the risk adjustments, um, how they've built their per member per month by payer and any actuarial assumptions that were made and how their rates of growth align with the budget guidance that's in part two of this manual uh, that Mike and Sarah will speak to. Um, we also asked them how their payer contracts align with the all payer model ACO agreement and we asked them to describe how their contracts align and if there are any significant differences and possible rationale for that. Now I'm going to turn it over to Kelly to speak to the financial section. So for section four, the ACO financial plan, we've requested audited financial statements and it's our understanding we should have the 2017 report in July. Um, for we've requested comparative financial statement templates this year. That's both a combination of what was asked for last year um, as well as what we needed to ask for after both submissions came in. And that includes the balance sheet, income statement, and cash flow statement. And it covers actual 17 budget and projected 2018 and budget 19. We're requesting they complete financial performance templates. These are all similar to last year's reporting um, and they are broken out in multiple ways. It covers revenues and expenses by alternative payment model categories and revenues and expenses by service, by payer, and line of business. We're requesting reporting for participating hospitals, which is also the same as last year's um, request that was made post-submission to the ACO. Um, this is a breakdown of all payer model revenue and payments to and from participating hospitals by payer. 
This includes the maximum risk per participating hospital, as well as the attributed lives by participating hospital. We're requesting, again, narratives related to budget spending. This includes, but is not limited to, industry benchmarks they may have used to create their budget, methodology surrounding qualification and payments, payment amounts for incentive payments, justification for the growth rates submitted, breakdown of delivery system reform dollars and the related goals, HIT spending strategy at both the ACO level and provider support, budget assumptions related to utilization, and changes in provider network configuration and the impact on utilization. We've also requested a description of any changes to their funds flow. And for the risk, sec risk section, we've requested, again, a risk mitigation plan for the ACO and all those taking risk, as well as an actuarial opinion that risk arrangements do not threaten the solvency of the ACO and any additional documentation surrounding risk that the ACO may have. All right, the way it has a big stand. <laughs> so um, section five is all about the ACO's quality, population health, model of care, and community integration initiatives. So uh, we have asked the um, one who provided their clinical priorities to us for 2018, and we've asked them for an evaluation of how they're doing in 2018 and what their projection is for 2019 and if those clinical priorities have changed. And some of them, for example, are reducing admissions and emergency department utilization and increasing follow-up after an emergency uh, room discharge from su for substance use or mental health diagnoses. So we also then asked them for an evaluation of how they're doing on the ACO quality activities related to the Alpair model agreement, the 20, 2021 agreement uh, measures that are in the agreement, and um, both for 2018 and 2019. And we're interested if uh, there are specific measures, outcomes, and changes. We are also asking how one here is tracking and capturing input from patients and providers and provider satisfaction as they're moving through this value-based model. Um, we've asked for a data analysis where there's, they stratify their population into four their four population health quadrants and how those total costs of care may differ by health service area. Um, we have questions about the implementation of Care Navigator and also any care management activities and their growing capacity for substance use disorder treatment in the local health service areas. And then finally, we have financial tables in here on their community integration initiatives, which are the investments and incentives that Mike spoke to earlier. So we are interested in how they are investing in prevention, community-based care, and primary care. We did receive uh, tables last year that totaled about $25 million with per member per month payments that they were making and also the blueprint and SASH payments, so we expect those to show up here as well. But we're asking how they're doing in 2018 regarding those investments and any plan changes for 2019. So I'm going to, um, Michelle will speak specifically about how we're measuring primary care spending in section three. And now we're going back to Mike to talk about the budget guidance regarding the all care model agreement. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, in deciding whether to modify or approve an ACO's budget, one of um, uh, the things that you are to consider is uh, the requirements of the all-payer ACO model agreement. Because that is part of the rule, um, that that's going to be a consideration, we uh, didn't restate all those requirements from the, the agreement that I mentioned earlier. Um, but we did uh, decide to include um, basically the all-payer ACO model agreements parameters in terms of um, what you can do in um, establishing the uh, benchmark for the 2019 Medicare ACO initiative. Um, so specifically, the all-payer ACO model agreement 
requires that the the 2019 benchmark be established so that either one, the annual growth rate is at least 0.2 percentage points below projected annual growth from 2018 to 2019 for Medicare nationally, or two, the compounded annualized growth rate is at least 0.1 percentage points below the projected compounded annualized growth rate from 2017 to 2019 for Medicare nationally. Um, so that is what the agreement requires, and uh, Sarah Lindbergh is going to explain what that means with numbers. So the Medicare benchmark um, is a total spend um, that we're allowed, and it's broken up into a few parts. One is for aged and disabled, or otherwise people who don't have something called end-stage renal disease. Um, and then there's a subcomponent for those with end-stage renal disease. So as you can see, um, the costs for those members are much higher, but they're a very small portion of our population. So according to our 2017 numbers, 0.36% of Vermont uh, Medicare beneficiaries, traditional fee-for-service, uh, have that are in that aid category or in that bucket. <clears throat> and so, therefore, um, when you look at and another thing to keep in mind, there's so many moving parts, but these are the values that are announced each April in the Medicare Advantage United States. Oh, what does the PCC stand for? Yeah, that's okay. Anyway, it's so basically this is um, the capitation rates that people who are bidding for Medicare Advantage are using in order to help price plans. And so this is what they're projecting the cost for traditional non-Medicare Advantage um, fee-for-service rates to be PMPM. -PM. There we go. The annual projected national Medicare, total cost of care, professionary, oh no, I'm sorry, per capita, I should have guessed that, per capita fee-for-service projections. So per, per, per capita, these are the costs per member per month, um, according to the most recent models. So, so in uh, this past April, they said that they're expecting at the end of this year that it would have cost about 850 bucks um, per member per month to take care of the aged and disabled population and about $7,500 to take care of the end-stage renal disease. And at this point, they're projecting um, those numbers to increase by 4% into 2019 for the non-ESRD or end-stage renal disease and increase by 3.3% for the end-stage renal disease. Uh, so therefore, uh, according to the agreement, these are numbers that are important and we um, are restricted by, uh, by them in order to set uh, the growth rate for the Medicare portion of the benchmark. So when we blend those together, just a weighted uh, calculation based on eligibility, we get 4% uh, for the annual projected growth rate and 3.8% for the K or the compounded annual growth rate. So obviously we only have two years and the first year was set um, because we had the floor. So 1.37 is not anything that actually occurred. That was what the floor set up for us as the first term in that equation. Um, so according to those values, um, we're, our ceiling, the most that we can do is either the 3.8 based on the annual growth rate or the 3.7 based on the compound annual growth rate. You guys, this is going to be embarrassing. Look at my equation. <laughs> <laughs> So as Mike mentioned earlier, there is a statutory criteria related to primary care investments in Rule 5. Um, GMCB staff, along with some stakeholders, have identified a process by which we can monitor some ACO network spending on primary care services. And I probably won't say this enough, but this will be a test year. It is a trial. Um, we're still working out the kinks in some of this information. 
And at some point, we would like to move to be able to evaluate this on a statewide level as well, but we're starting with the ACO. Uh, so as you can see on this slide, we'll be looking at both claims and non-claims-based spending in the ACO network. I don't need to walk you through the equation. It's much simpler than Sarah's. Uh, just a note here that we requested um, data at the all-payer and payer-specific level, which could then also be broken down to a PMPM amount um, for those uh, attributed lives. And again, test year. Uh, for this test year, I should note too, we're requesting that ACO submit uh, information for calendar year 2017 actual, calendar year 2018 projected, and calendar year 2019 budget. And all of those terms should be right because Kelly taught me. <laughs> uh, for, uh, this is just a, very simplistic overview of what we're looking at. So the claims-based spending will be calculated using a subset of provider types and CPT codes as the numerator. That was identified through, again, some stakeholder processes and really building off of the SIM work group um, that calculation that was done a few years ago. And if you recall, Rachel Block from Millbank had come to the board and presented on some of this data not too long ago. Um, and she had also spoken with the primary care advisory group uh, and brought some of this forward. For the non-claim space spending, again, as Mike mentioned earlier, we're, we were really looking at what we know the ACO has now and what we can build off of. And so this is not a comprehensive list of what will be included in that, but just as an example of things that we're looking at to include in that numerator and, of course, also in the denominator. Um, but again, the, the numerator will be those payments that go to primary care. The rest of it will be um, the spending that's allocated throughout the network. Um, so. The, there's a note here that we've, the provider types and CPT codes we can share, um, they're in the guidance if folks are interested in seeing those. And again, we're still sort of working out what, what should and shouldn't be in there. And Sarah's team has been tremendously helpful in um, pointing out some places where we may have some gaps in that information. Um, but with that, it's back to Melissa. I know. <laughs> okay, so now we're back to the timeline for the public comment and vote for the budget guidance, and we'd love to open it up for any comments or questions from the board. So I'll start it off. Um, one of the things that we continually hear from uh, providers is how they chose to go in the field of medicine to actually provide quality care for their patients and spend time with the patients. And they feel like they have, um, in the old days, we would, we would say become paper pushers, but in today's world, we call keyboard pushers. And um, I know that uh, we continually ask the ACO to provide us with um, what they are doing to reduce the administrative burden for providers. I'm wondering if we're asking ourselves if anything that we're asking is adding to the burden in an, in an unnecessary fact, factor. So are, are we taking a look at all our quality measures and making sure that they really make sense and that they can be reported in a, in a way that doesn't uh, increase the burden on the providers? Um, so I wish Pat was here to speak. <laughs> About, oh, Michelle can speak yeah. about. Um, yeah. Uh, so I can at attempt to speak to that. So um, we have the 2021 20, measures in the all payer model agreement, but the ACO negotiates their uh, payer level measures with their payer contracts. And so we don't necessarily have any control over what goes into those. Um, but I think that there is a tremendous amount of alignment that we've seen in the in years, uh, in this year's uh, contracts at least. And um, so they're moving towards sort of reducing that burden. And I think, I mean, does that somewhat answer your question? <laughs> trying to make them as claims based as possible so that the um, clinicians nor the ACO needs to go into the charts to do the chart review. That doesn't reduce the amount of data that needs to be entered, but that data would be going to the payers anyways for claims-based payments. 
as we move down the timeline over time, I think what a lot of providers are looking for is to make sure that this isn't just an additional administrative expense too to the system. Um, it's a coalition of the willing, and in order for it to succeed, the people that are part of that coalition have to be spreading the word to their, their peers and colleagues elsewhere that um, it's actually something that's benefiting their patients and it it is improving quality while at the same time controlling costs, moving people away from fee-for-service into a value-based system. And do we think that we have everything that we should have in the guidance to try to push that mission? I did add a new question in Section 5 about provider satisfaction as they move into the value-based model. We could reevaluate the question to determine if there's anything additional that we'd like to ask there to get more specific. I would also say as well we're expecting um, a report at the end of June from the ACO on their new capitated pilot for primary care providers, independent primary care providers, which includes an evaluation of reduced administrative burden. That will help us determine what the first six months have looked like for this new value-based model. Great. Questions from the board? I would just respond to your question, Kevin, by also saying that I think um, as, as part of the 2019 guidance, there's a request for an evaluation of consistency across alignment across payers. And so I think that's another area where we can look to ask, is this increasing or reducing administrative burden? Because the more alignment, logical alignment, I should say, that we have there, I think it addresses some of the issues that you've raised. Um, I did have one question, which is in uh, the time overall timeline for the process, um, are you thinking that we would receive information about um, the Medicare and other trend components on obviously the 17th from the ACO, but on the 7th from you all, and that, that would, we would concurrently vote on the Medicare trend at the same time as the overall budget, because we didn't do that, that quite that way last year, so I just wanted to check about that piece. We're fine. We also agree that we'd like to align those timelines as much as possible. We're currently discussing when we would receive the data from Medicare. We are anticipating that we would have a preliminary number on November 7th to discuss with you. I, I would like to say that's subject to change because it so much is in our control, but we're working closely with our federal partners to ensure that we receive that information as sooner than last year. That's great because, of course, uh, as we all know, Medicare sometimes thinks they can do something, and then just like anybody else operationalizing it, they sometimes run into snafus like last Right. Year. They're also working, because of our agreement in 2019 being the Vermont Modified ACO Initiative, they have some flexibility in how they receive the provider list and also review the provider list at the federal level, and they'll work on that through their provider agreement with the ACO. Thank you. So I would just note that we, we expect to have the final, so the preliminary um, numbers by the November 7th uh, date and the finalized numbers uh, within that 7th through 21st time period, I think on the earlier side in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. We are trying to adhere as closely as we can to setting the Medicare benchmark by December 1st or by 30 days before the calendar year starts. So. I just have a question about um, some of the new statutory certification requirements. Um, in the sense, I know this is recent language that was, you know, passed by the legislature this session, um, and now it's part of the certification requirements for, for the ACO. And I'm wondering. I think we, as a board, have to think about um, how we're going to evaluate whether the ACO has met the certification. Uh, additional certification requirements. As I look at the language, you know, for the first one, um, the ACO has to ensure equal access to appropriate mental health care. How do we evaluate that that is equal access? And how do we think about, in the second one, um, whether the ACO has received and distributed payments in a fair and equitable manner? What is their fair and equitable? And how do we know that they've minimized differentials? 
And again, also in the third one, how are we going to evaluate whether the connections and incentives um, to address ACEs have been met? So I guess I'm, I'm throwing out to everybody here, uh, you know, whether we should be putting guidance out there about, you know, some guardrails for how we think that that should be evaluated or whether we should wait and see what they submit and then evaluate from there. So I don't know. But I, as I was looking at some of this language, I was thinking, you know, this, is, this could be a challenge and um, guardrails might be helpful beforehand or but this is also the first year it's in place. We've just received this language. So maybe seeing what the ACO submits and then evaluating from there. So I don't have an answer. Just throwing that out there for you all and then really to all of us to think about. I think that's a great point, Jess, because I think some some of the language also makes it sound like that ACO is either the payer or the actual provider when they're not really either of those things. So right. I think that does make it a little more tricky. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's tricky language, so how do we evaluate that they've met this criteria? Yeah. And can I just jump in because Mike Barber and I spoke a little bit about this this morning and to exactly your question, Jess, how will this look like? Look, you know, how is it going to play out at the board? And um, we're going to talk a little more, but um, we likely will have a recommendation from the staff to you guys, which you you can then add to or um, you know provide input to from the staff. Because it, it you're right, it just came. I mean, it's we just got it mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago, and now we need to evaluate whether they're adhering to all of these new changes. I would also say um, to complicate things a little bit, we also have the rule amendments that we are working on. And if we are going to put some standards around how we're going to evaluate these things, um, it makes sense to put it in the rule. It doesn't mean it can't also be um, guidance for the ACO uh, before that rule is finalized, which wouldn't be until February of next year at the earliest. Um, so another another piece of the puzzle, I guess, to think about. OK, this time I'll open it up to the uh, public for comments or questions. Ken. Yes, thank you. Uh, I I have to say, I think uh, Jessica Holmes sort of captured a reaction that I had on the first two uh, new statutory requirements. I underlined, you know, payments fair and equitable. And um, it would take, you know, uh, the wise men and women of the world to easily uh, handle that, I think. But I wanted to, to, to go back to the first one, which uh, for a lot of different reasons, including that everybody has stated that our mental health system is in great disrepair, and it is, and, and under a lot of crisis. So when I look at this statement, um, I, I'm left with the feeling that a lot of this is just verbiage that isn't going to really get attention because uh, it's, it's significant in what it says, but the question really it goes back to the Green Mountain Care Board. How might you um, relate to this question? You know, it mentions the Institute for Medicine. How many board members are aware of the history of the Institute for Medicine and its re relationship to mental health and its reports and its relationship to parity and other issues? And it's, it is a specialty. So I just, I would throw out an idea that uh, may not be popular, but um, it seems to me that it's, it's uh, you know, given the, the assignment here, which is really an assignment to the Green Mountain Care Board, new models may be needed to at least explore, and it may be a mental health is a good one to use as an example. So I would just say, if you read the language here, in terms of, of the Green Mountain Care Board, it uh, has to make sure or ensure the following criteria, that the Green Mountain Care Board think about creating an independent panel that would be charged with the responsibility of helping frame those questions and come up with a conclusion. If not, we're going to do what we always have done in healthcare. If you want to know how things are going, you know, in our many parts of our healthcare system, you turn to the insurers and you say, how, how are things going? That's how you get the information. And I think 
again, I think, you know, to some degree, the, the questions are enormous and important and overwhelming. And the only ones that would have the information is the ACO. So, you know, you kind of are asking the ACO over a year's time to say, how are you doing? And I don't think that's a good model. I don't think it's worked at all. Um, so anyway, it's just an idea to, to throw out to say, suppose a, some kind of independent panel uh, helped take those questions and also uh, be charged with giving some assessment rather than having it be the ACO itself or state agencies which have a kind of a stake in this um, and it might help produce better answers than uh, you know, a group of well-meaning people who, you know, uh, have a hard time getting arms around this one as well as some others. So that's the comment. I think it's an appropriate comment. It's something that uh, I know causes me to lose sleep at night because I look at everything that we're tasked to do, and all of it is legitimate. We should be doing those things. But then we have the competing interests of making the goals under the all-payer model. And um, they probably didn't intend to do this, but at least from my vantage point, at times I feel like we're being set up by the legislature to spin off some traditional costs that are in the human service budget rather mm -hmm. than in a healthcare system budget. And if we assimilate those into the system, it makes our goal of reaching the targets under the all-payer model even harder. So, you know, you've raised some huge points and some that there are no easy answers for. Other questions or comments? Dale. I know it all makes sense. I, I know, just confirming what you just said, yeah. It, we have to have it this way, and like he just said. What I'm always looking for is I want to get this into Heidi's presentation. I'm just using this <coughs> as an example. So I've got better clarity of what the ACO delivers. I want something more substantial that I can Bring it to anybody, and they will understand what the ACO is doing and how it's making a difference in their life. Right now, I can't do that. I just, it's a comment more of frustration. <coughs> this is always high level. It, it's like that, what do they call that? The fourth arm of government, DFR would be an example. You don't see them, but they're extremely important. This is hitting me a lot of times like that. And I just find that frustrating. I don't think there's a question in it. <laughs> there is. <laughs> I was going to say, Kevin, if you'll kind of let me address that, and just to pull a couple of the thoughts together, starting with your own on um, administrative burden. And what I would look at, and certainly the alignment of measures is a, a, a critical uh, burden reduction initiative for sure. But also, I look at that as in two ways. That's the accountable part of accountable care. We have metrics that we look at routinely, become a learning health system based on the needs and the resources, and certainly, Dale Heidi's presentation bears out that the measures we have have many areas that are, I don't see them as um, burdensome, but as opportunities for improvement. I think Ken's case in point, um, certainly uh, for the integration of mental health parity, both in delivery and payment, and just those opportunities to keep focusing the momentum of the system in the guardrails of those measures as priorities. So I don't know if that kind of answers what you're looking for. That's the clarity I try to bring forward and um, try to live every day. It goes there. Yep. Any other comments or questions? Yes, Tom. 
Thank you. Um, my name is Tom Reese, and, and uh, I know a couple of you, and had the privilege of having spoken with you before, and look forward to meeting the rest of the chair board. I'd like to, to come back around and address one of the issues that Ken raised, and, and I come to you wearing kind of three different hats. Um, I'm a hospital CEO by training and experience, um, and have spent uh, the last 20 years of my career consulting with uh, many hospital and health system organizations around the country on issues of clinical resource management and population health. So there's one hat. Um, my local hat is that I'm the board president of NFI Vermont, which is a provider of statewide acute adolescent care for mental health to our, uh, our younger population. And so I have some fair amount of uh, understanding of the current challenges that face the mental health system. And I'm totally sympathetic with Kent State relative to how we balance those and the tremendous challenge that that presents to you. And the third hat I wear is a deep passion that I've spent the last five years exercising and learning about. And, and that's uh, growth out of my work at NFI, and that's the impact ACEs are having on the population of the state of Vermont and its families and children. And I um, would like to just make two quick comments for you. The first is I bring to you a deep appreciation for the, the work that this board does and the unbelievable challenge that you face right now as you're trying to bridge the known, which is hospital budgets and what those look like, and the total unknown relative to what this thing called an ACO really should do, what it looks like, and how it can even be observed in its functionality. And, and we all in the state should be deeply, deeply respectful of uh, the service you provide for us. The second is, uh, in exercise of my passion for ACEs, I have joined together with five other members of the, the, the private sector um, as we are trying to organize the private sector to help the public sector and to help the, the healthcare sector deal with the issue of ACEs. And I personally, over the past 20 months, 24 months, have spent uh, literally hundreds of hours um, in consultation and discussion with um, many in the private sector around the state. Um, we formed an organization called Resilience Partners, Transformation Partners, um, with the intention of, of actually focusing and energizing the rest of the, the population relative to this issue that, that uh, in my estimation, is costing us cash-wise every year something in the neighborhood of $385 million we're spending on children who are suffering from ACEs. And we can't afford not to do something about that. And we need to do something about it now. So I would offer to you that as you look at, at certainly the ACEs section of your responsibility that's been handed to you by the legislature, it's, it's too early for you to really be able to put your arms around that, but it's there, and it's a huge opportunity for this Green Mountain Care Board to influence what happens in the evolution of our ability to manage ACEs in this community and this state. So I am offering to you that I would be more than happy to, to share knowledge with you, share our plans with you, um, and to perhaps help um, understand how they interplay between all of those trying to deal with ACEs right now and the ACO might come together and would be more than happy to, to kind of step in the middle of that process and do whatever I can do to help from the private sector with your deliberation. Thank you, Tom. We appreciate that. I see another arm back there. Is that you, Susan? Uh, yes. Uh, Susan Arnold from the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. And this is more of a question for the board than for the presenters. I'm wondering, I've raised this issue of affordability of health care um, and whether or not the board is, is content. So my question is, 
Is the board contemplating working into the budget process or to some other process maybe an evaluation whereby we would know whether or not people who are attributed to an ACO, Medicare ACO and commercial ACO in particular, whether or not being attributed is impacting the affordability of their health care compared to people who aren't attributed? Do they have more out-of-pocket expenditures? Do they have, are they paying more co-pays? We wouldn't expect to see much of a difference in the Medicaid ACO because Medicaid beneficiaries tend not to have co-pays and deductibles, but people in Medicare and people with um, Blue Cross Blue Shield do. And it just seems that we're gonna go another year, you know, we're in test year one and we'll be getting results this week we'll be getting results from 2017. It'll be a while till we get the results from 2018, but it would be nice if at some point you guys build into the process requirement that part of the evaluation that looks at affordability considers what is the financial impact of being in an attributed life. As you know, people have no choice as to whether or not to be in an attributed life. Your only choice is to leave a provider if that provider becomes a participant. But as, a, as an attributed life, we are basically generators of funds for the ACOs. Don't get you know a per member per month payment for me whether I see a doctor or not, or how many services I use or not. But what is the impact on me if I am using it? And you know, there's one thing in the budget criteria about the ACOs are supposed to report on their innovative spend. It's like, will we ever see if the people are actually getting those air conditioners or vacuum cleaners or, you know, mold-free mattresses, all the things of flexibility that an ACO is supposed to bring. So I'm wondering for the board when and how it will be worked into the evaluation process to, to look at the affordability for individuals on their health care, the impact of being in attributed life or not. Especially since we're supposed to be gearing up to getting 90% of Vermonters in in the next five years. So the question really relates to what the individual's out-of-pocket expenses are as far as co-pays or, or deductibles or what have you. And um, certainly one would think that as you move into a more value-based system that Inherently, you would tend to believe there would be less out of pocket, but that may or may not be the case. And I think that the only real way that we have to measure that, Susan, is through the public comment um, process where we actually hear from Vermonters. And um, up to this point, I don't think we've heard from anyone that has told us they believe that their uh, co pays and, and the out of pocket are going up, unlike what we hear when a practice is taken over by a hospital and all of a sudden those expenses do go up. Um, even though they may be going to the same doctor in the same building, um, but all of a sudden they're, they're paying more out of pocket. So I, I think that the, the doctors aren't gonna be able to answer that question for us and probably the ACO won't be able to either. It'll be actual Vermonters who will have to answer that question for us. I have a thought, and, and I don't know if uh, there, if we would have the data for this, but to the, if there is evidence that emergency room utilization and those sorts of higher, those are areas where people tend to have higher co-pays, if that's going down and primary care is going up, there may be some way to sort of quantify it based on service usage, not, maybe not comprehensively, uh, and certainly not on a per person basis, but I, that could give us potentially a little glimpse into uh, into that question. But again, I don't know that we have that sort of ability to do that with the data that we have available, but it's certainly something we can ask. Sarah? Yeah, part of me. So uh, for commercial and Medicare in particular, it's still pretty closely married to the fee-for-service architecture, meaning that claims are submitted as usual. So what will be, um, in Medicare's case, they will do a 100% fee reduction for the paid amount, Medicare's portion, but we'll still have a record of the out-of-pocket amount. And uh, for me uh, the commercial programs, it's going to be settled up at the end, so it'll look as usual. Um, and also, so yeah, I, I agree, while there might be differences in utilization as far as benefit structure and stuff, I don't think the ACO
PCO would have a whole lot of um, influence on that, so I'd be surprised to see differences for the same sorts of services. But um, yeah, it's certainly something I think that we can take a look at. Um, if I may follow up, I think it is known that when people receive care coordination, they start using services, certain services at a higher rate, which does maybe result in better health for them, but it would also result in more copays. So instead of getting back surgery, maybe now you're going to go to physical therapy, you know, five times a month or whatever it is. Physical therapy has a higher copay, it's a specialist service. So I really do think we shouldn't rely on, on anecdotal information from people who may or may not even know that they're an attributed life and might not know what that means to be an attributed life. If the data is available, it, and I'm sure the data should be available, it just seems to be that, as I always say, you know, you value what you measure, and if we're serious about affordability being a primary concern, affordability of healthcare for Vermonters, then we should be concerned about, is this reform that we're putting in place, how is that impacting Vermonters' actual pocketbooks, Vermonters' actual healthcare expenditures? And someone should figure out at what level we collect that data and compare it. Maybe it's the best thing. Maybe people on ACOs will have lower out-of-pocket expenses and then don't clamor to be in and get their providers to join. But we don't know what we don't know until we measure it or collect it in any serious way, and it seems like it would be you guys who would make that happen. And I think we'll go through another year of not knowing. So anyone can speculate, but in the meantime, we don't know. Well, I think Sarah's taken the uh, charge to try to figure out a way to uh, analyze this, so we'll see what she comes up with. Stay tuned. What's that? Stay tuned. Well, I hope, I hope that's a charge to analyze. That would be awesome. Walter. Thanks, Kevin. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to ask you to talk about the just wanted to follow up on Susan's, and she's made some great points, but I think we all should remember that co-pays and deductibles are designed to restrict access to health care and increase profits. And if we don't keep, put that out in the open, that's what they're designed to do. And when you talk about affordability, no one can afford the co-pays and deductibles. And frankly, I don't see the ACO reducing those. They might reduce premiums, but they're not going to reduce the co-pays and deductibles. For that reason, or at least I see it now, but I could be wrong. But I don't see them reducing that. And well, they can't. They, they really can't from because the of is co -pays and you yeah. and killing them. Yeah, but you're right. Mm -hmm. You're right about the yeah. the premium is where it would impact because the deductible and the copay is still the payers' premium. And I'm not going to say that I agree with this position, but. I'm sure you've heard the same argument from some of the providers that that's not what the co-pays are for. It's to invest the patient in their care so that uh, they are concerned about the outcomes and are a willing partner in trying to improve their, their health status. Actually, I've heard that before, too. Yeah. Not yeah. in the way you phrased it, but I've heard the same generic comment before, and I think that's part of the spin on it. I hear it repeatedly from doctors that say if patients aren't invested, they're not going to follow the, the proper uh, rehab and everything else. So, Dale. Yeah. Clarification question only on, but this involves Sue because it's the same topic. During the legislative session, I think, I know it did. I, I asked this question, but I think she was there, and that's why I say, she, she was part of the conversation. They did say the ACO is not going to reduce the copays, but they admitted to there can be an accumulative effect as they integrate the services. You can end up with more copays, which does bring up an affordability issue of that accumulation of the call pays, and that's where the conversation ended. Nobody knew what that impact was going to be. So just using Sue's example for a minute, I, I think if you look at, so if you have, in this case, if you are referred to physical therapy and physical therapy resolves your issue in lieu of surgery, would, 
with you know, whatever outcome. You will have more physical therapy co-pays, which will add up to a certain amount, but you will not have the surgery co-insurance or co-pay, depending on your plan design, that you would have paid with surgery. So I think it, it's hard, it is something that's hard to measure because it's gonna be a person by person, condition specific issue, which is why I was saying maybe we could look at sort of what the overall trends are in care utilization and see if there's kind of an aggregate way to get a handle on that because we don't, we're not gonna be able to look at each and every single individual to see, to make that comparison on an individual basis. We just don't have the staff to do that. But I think we could um, try to look at trends and see how that could be in the aggregate affecting co-pays. So I think what I'm hearing us say is we think it's an interesting issue. It's not simple, and we do have limited staff capacity in data analytics, and we have a lot on our plate in data analytics, including required federal reporting, but we're gonna look into it and see if we can figure something out. You know, it may not be for this year, it may take longer, I don't know, but um, I have full confidence that if anybody can figure out, our data team can. And I, I guess I have full confidence too. I guess I would just also encourage folks to. No pressure, Sarah. <laughs> um, I guess I would also encourage focus people to realize that we have to take the long view here, in the sense that really what we're trying to do is allocate resources towards primary care, towards preventative care, and that is a complete system transformation, and that's going to take time to show the return on that investment. And so to the extent that we allocate more money to preventative care, primary care now, we might not see the returns on that investment until five years from now. And people are not going to emergency rooms for, you know, or 20 years from like, now. 20 years or, you know, whatever it is. And, and to Tom's point about investing in ACEs and things like that, these are upfront investments that may cost more now, but are going to have longer term effects. And I just want to encourage everybody to realize that we may not see, be able to quantify these short run gains, but we have to have that long view. So. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, that was a lively uh, exchange of thoughts. And uh, I want to thank the panel because uh, each of you are working very, very hard to uh, try to make this a reality. So thank you for everything that you do for the day. Okay. Is there any old business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Second. So we've moved in second to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.